sure you leave your uh, cameras turned on because that's how we count quorum. Uh, the staff will come and go as needed uh, with respect to answering questions uh, that we have of them. Uh, raise the raise hand button to speak. Um, if you if you don't have that capacity, just stick your hand up and hopefully I'll notice it. Um, let's see, clerk staff, lower that hand when we're all done. Uh, if we have a, an interruption, we've got 15 minutes to regain quorum. So let me ask if there's anybody that has a conflict of interest before we begin this morning. Uh, Councillor Antosky. Yes, Mr. Chair, I have a conflict with 5.1. We are family businesses involved in the funeral industry. Councillor, thank you for that. Anyone else? Okay, uh, we don't have anybody presenting or delegating today. Um, so if I could ask for a mover and seconder for everything before us today. I see I have uh, Councillor Celeste, Councillor Vanderstilt for that. Um, we have item 516162. Um, is there anything folks would like separated for discussion? Any of those items? Councillor Miller. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, sorry, just going back and forth between you and my notes here, but I'd like that. Uh, I got a question on uh, 6 1. So if we could separate that for discussion, that'd be great. I'm on mute. Uh, are there any other items to be separated for discussion? Uh, thank you for that. Seeing none, I will call the question on everything except 6 1. Uh, show of hands, those in favor, please. And let me count here. Mayor, calling the question on everything except 6 1. Thank you for being with us this Sorry. morning. Sorry, I came in uh, late, another meeting. And so 5.1 wasn't separated? Correct. Would you like it separated? Yeah, because I think maybe an amendment might be in order. Isn't it automatically separated because of the conflict? Oh, you are sharp today, Councillor Wall. Thank you for catching that. Uh, yes, you're absolutely right. It is separated for the conflict. Um, so uh, I will call the question then on 6.2, those in favor. That's the minutes. Thank you, and that carries. Uh, now, uh, before we forge on, I, I did want to recognize the passing of uh, Helen Mulligan. Uh, Helen, uh, two or three term county councillor involved in a huge way in, in the community in uh, St. George and in the county. Uh, something of an accomplished artist. Some of her watercolors hung in my council office for a period of time, a number of years ago. Um, she's sure gonna be missed uh, in that community and in our community. Um, I had the pleasure to work with her for quite a long time on social services, uh, housing, uh, John Noble and a number of other files. And she sure was a, a caring and dedicated and uh, loving woman and um, we're all gonna miss her. Um, is there anybody else that would like to speak to um, Helen's uh, passing? Uh, Mark, go ahead, please. Thank you. I, I just want to also mention her amazing work uh, as a leader with the Grand River Community Health Center, which helped thousands and thousands of vulnerable folks and uh, and actually just thousands and thousands of folks in the, the city and the county. Um, I got to work with her for several years when I worked there, and she was an exceptional, exceptional leader in that regard, too. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Uh, uh, Councillor Sless, go ahead, please. Uh, yeah, thanks, Dan. Yeah, I, I got to work uh, closely with with Helen on the uh, Brown County Health Unit. And she uh, she was a very dedicated, very very knowledgeable person. Uh, her background was, uh, we were very fortunate to have somebody with her background on that. And she was kind of the, the, the right hand of Janice Mills. I think they, they were kind of uh, joined at the hip. Uh, I, I'm sure Janice is probably suffering this morning because that was a very close friendship. And uh, I think they traveled together. They, they, they did everything together. So it was, uh, I'm sure a great loss to Jan to Janice as well, but uh, I, I think j just in general, a big loss for the community because she was an advocate in so many different directions that uh, it was hard to keep up with her. And she uh, she was very dedicated as a board member at the health unit. That's where I, I worked mo most closely with her and uh, very accommodating, but also a very strong opinion. And, uh, and whatever her opinion was, she would certainly defend it and defend it well. So it was, uh, it was a pleasure to work with her. It's it's one of those unfortunate, uh, I guess, things in life that you lose folks that you shouldn't lose and you lose them too early. But um, she'll, she'll be missed and she'll certainly be remembered, Mr. Chair. 
Yeah, well said, John. Uh, Councillor Bell. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I first met Helen when I ran for office in St. George in 2014 uh, and lost, and she was uh, exceptionally helpful in helping me uh, to understand what I could do differently and better. Uh, came back in 2018 when she actually was then again one of my constituents. Uh, she'd moved from St. George to Paris during that time. Uh, but I knew her better from the health unit as John Sless did. And she was my immediate predecessor as chair of the Board of Health. And she helped me uh, when I was in the role of vice chair uh, to prepare for taking on uh, the additional role. Since she left, we've been in communication. So she's kept a, or had a keen interest in what was going on at the health unit. And when I ran into occasional uh, conundrums, uh, she was there to help me. So I will miss her. And uh, I, I think the community as a whole will miss her. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Mayor Bailey. Yeah, I, I'd just like to say that Helen, Helen was a very dear friend. I've known her for many, many years, just as being a friend long before politics. And um, she, was, she was one of those people that, uh, she was part of the whole downtown St. George thing when downtown St. George was thriving and we had four or five tour buses every Sunday afternoon and antiques and nice people just sort of standing around the corner, corners and sitting on benches, just talking all day. She also put in a program in St. George where you, you would knight someone, you, you would get knighted in St. George on the gazebo, which is now on my property. And she was a very, she was a very big supporter of um, small business. And I met her also through Trillium through the Boys and Girls Club, where she made some very good decisions, helping children every way she could. And her nursing obviously showed through and most of her trillion decisions, she did the right thing for the right reasons. And I'm going to miss her personally. And uh, I, I just, just feel bad for, for Jan Mills too. They, they really were joined at the hip and they were good together. And I liked, I liked when they were together, they were fun and you could always tell that they enjoyed being wherever they were. So. She's going to be she's going to be missed. Well said, Mayor. Thank you very much. And could you keep us informed if there's any um, official recognition by the county of Helen's life, please? Uh, Mayor okay. Davis. Yeah, just echo the comments that, that others have made. I've also known Helen for a long time and talk about a model citizen who really dedicated to her community and, and not just in, in the aspect of the, the healthcare community. She had so many different interests, made a contribution in so many different ways. Uh, my my um, work with her was at the health unit as well. And uh, I gotta say that, yeah, she, she had definite viewpoints and doesn't hesitate to express them. And even uh, would tell me, after she got off the board uh, on the floor of the Mount <laughs> Valley, she would make it very clear to me what her opinion was on issues. And but actually, it was you know very knowledgeable and uh, with a desire to see that the the health unit uh, would improve as much as possible. So I agree that she'll be greatly missed, and the community, both the County of Brant and the City of Brantford, will be poor for the fact that she's no longer with us. And uh, condolences to her family, and in particular, Janice Mills. Yes, they certainly were a tight fit together. So, uh, but uh, yeah, that's it. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Mayor, thank you very much. We're going to move on now with the business at hand. Mayor, uh, I'll, 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 uh, I'll uh, suggest that you are the separator for 5.1, so you can have the floor uh, to begin. Yeah, I'd, really, I had one question for staff. And I think there's, it was mentioned somewhere in the report that the savings would be estimated to be about 150, yeah, there it is, 153,000. And that's coming out of the social assistance funerals. And I know one of the reasons given for this, to do this was that uh, money saved would be used for other uh, benefits provided to those who are on social assistance, could be dental, wide glass, hearing aids, child car seats, that sort of thing. Wondering then, for a question to staff through you, Mr. Chair, assuming that that projection bears out and we continue in this direction, what would you anticipate doing with those monies and will we see a report coming to us in the future about that? Good morning, uh, Susan Evenden, Director of Family and Income Stability. 
through the chair, the uh, yes, the savings that we expect to realize in 2022 and beyond, we're currently in the process of evaluating our discretionary program as a whole. So uh, funerals was the first component because it was at the time the largest single line item in that budget. Uh, so we're doing a couple of things. Uh, we're evaluating our current rates. And as one example, I can uh, let the committee know that we're currently using dental rates from 1998. Uh, so that is definitely due for an increase uh, as well for emergency dental. And we are also going to obtain the policies of other municipalities just to have a look at items that uh, perhaps we're not covering now that might be useful to include. And we should have a report back to this committee um, in quarter one of 2022 with the results of that evaluation. Uh, another question, uh, to Mr. Chair, through you to, I guess excuse me, you'd be the best one to answer it. At 9.4 of the report, there's three recommendations for it's called future considerations to improve the program. And, but I noticed that really wasn't, I don't think it was incorporated into what the resolution is. So if one was interested in seeing if this moves forward, that there be these enhancements, if I can call it that, how would we address that? Would we do an amendment to the, the recommendation, the four part recommendation? I will, uh, through the chair, defer to the clerk on that. That's my understanding. Through, through the chair, uh, to the mayor, yes, that's correct. So essentially what the committee we need to do is amend clause B uh, to include the adjustments one to three as identified in section 9.5, I'm sorry, section 9.4, future considerations in report 2021-598. So that form, part of clause B if the amendment carries. Well, Mr. Chair, I think I wanna make that amendment, but, I, but I, I won't make it right now, but I intend to uh, you know, uh, deferring to other members that they wish to comment about it. But not about the proposed amendment, but about the, the entire report. Mayor, thank you. Uh, Councillor Bell, you have the floor. Go ahead, please. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you to staff for preparing the report. I think it's important that we get the feedback on this new uh, way of doing things. Uh, I notice in 921, which is the client feedback, uh, that uh, 12 people or 12 uh, survey requests were not returned. Um, so I, I see that the balance are all very, very positive. And it sort of triggers in my mind a question I, I tried to raise last meeting uh, on a specific item uh, of a funeral or a burial that was going to take place uh, of a county resident. Uh, I was promised a response and I haven't had that response from staff, um, but is there any differentiation in responses from city folks and county folks? Because this has been a, a bone of contention, uh, as we're all aware, since this uh, proposal was made. Uh, through the chair, uh, in response to the first part of the question, uh, which I think is, uh, you know, the idea that uh, that if you don't receive negative survey responses, does that mean that there is no negative feedback? Uh, and so I can tell you for myself, I'm aware of two situations. One is the situation uh, that the councillor has referenced. Uh, that were escalated kind of to my level to look into. Both were situations in which unfortunately families were given informa incorrect information um, by someone uh, that was not a member of staff. Um, so the, uh, in the, in the particular situation, um, and I think in both situations, um, no contact was made actually with our approved service provider to uh, kind of walk through how the service would work. Um, and I will ask uh, our manager, Becky Lala, who's responsible for the funeral portfolio, uh, to kind of talk about the survey results and the uh, inclusion of, of county families. Good morning, Becky Lala, manager of income and family stability. Uh, through the chair to answer that question, uh, we do uh, serve families both in the county and in the city, as you are aware, and we do track stats in terms of the applications that are taken, whether it is a county or a city funeral. Um, through the 
survey results, the families uh, would have been included between March and uh, August of this year if we delivered a funeral. Um, and um, those county families would have been included had they been, um, had they been receiving a funeral service between that time. Mr. Chair, if I, if I may just, just respond to that. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Becky. I, I, I'm not quite sure I got the answer I was looking for. Uh, I'm, I'm interested to know if, there's any, if you have any differentiation in the feedback, uh, because the, the, the difference between county and, and city came up many times in our early discussions and, and the complexities of dealing with the county are different from those of dealing with city folks. And I wondered whether that reflected in any of your experience to date. Yes, thank you, Councillor Bell, for clarifying that for me. Um, yes, we will consider, uh, it was an oversight for the survey questions, you will see them. Um, we can provide them to you uh, through the chair, um, a list of the questions that were asked. Unfortunately, we didn't ask a question if it was the county or city funeral uh, through this client survey satisfaction survey, but we will certainly ask going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor, thank you. Uh, further discussion, folks? Seeing none, I, oh, oh. Yeah, seeing none, I'll go to the mayor for his amendment. Yeah, th thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll just lower my hand. Um, so given what I, the response to my question, I'm going to suggest that, well, there it is there. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, this motion would include in that section B, which would be what's set out in section nine for the report. And the reason why I'm doing this, uh, Mr. Chair, is because it really is not included in the, in the resolution that staff presented to us, that four-part resolution. And I think if you, if you, when you read carefully the report, there's a need to, shall we say, enhance the, the service moving forward. And that what I'm hoping is that that'll allow us to provide um, a better service, and it might also serve to make the program more attractive to other providers. I would hope so. And so that's the, the, the rationale behind this. So I guess I'm looking for a second. Just Councillor Vanderstel is uh, second. Mayor, thank you. Any discussion on the amendment before us, folks? I can't. Uh... Okay, we'll go to the vote. Those in favor of the amendment, raise your hand, please. One, two, three, four, five, six in favor. One, two, three, four, five opposed. Is that the count, Chris? Mine is a complex. Oh, right, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. So. So we have nine. So. So carries, yeah. So yeah, thank you. Uh, well, the clerk and I do some basic math. The amendment does carry. Uh, so we're back now to the main motion as amended one time. Is there any further discussion on the main motion? Councillor Laferriere, go ahead, please. I, I'm just I'm just wondering why why this report now and not before. Perhaps some changes may occur to our to our joint governance system. Is there is there a specific reason as to to the need for this at this time? And it may be that I miss uh, that this was the timing we had prescribed previous to. Through the chair, uh, yes, Councillor Laferriere, this report was requested by Social Services Committee at the time of approval of the prior report, which authorized staff to enter into this contract. Thank you. Councillor, is, um, is there a change to this that you're suggesting? Oh, I, I just had a question about the timing. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, no further discussion is evident, so we'll go. Oh, sorry, Mayor Bailey, go ahead, please. Yeah, I, just, I would just like to have a recorded vote if I could, Mr. Chair. Absolutely, we have that technology, sir. Uh, so we will, we will go to that vote now, um, and I'll ask those who are in favor to raise their hands and leave them until the clerk indicates that it's time to put them down. So those in favor, please raise your hands. 
Gary McCreary. Councillor Sluss. County Councillor Miller. Councillor Vanderstelt. Councillor Wall. Mayor Davis. Uh, those opposed, please raise your hand. Councillor Bell. Mayor David Bailey. Councillor Leferrier. Through the chair, the motion carries on a recorded vote. Noting Councillor Antoski's conflict of interest. Uh, thank you, guys. Okay, so um, Councillor um, Miller, I believe you asked to have a separation of item 6.1. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just a uh, a quick question, and there's so much information in that report. I will say it's an excellent report. Um, maybe not the happiest report when you look at how our area is not doing maybe as well as we should compared to the rest. Of the but in the report, there was uh, talk about how there was a 30% drop in uh, Ontario Works caseload uh, since March of 2020. That 30% caseload drop. Was there any savings at the municipal level? Um, I know the bulk of the money does come from the province, but was there any savings at the municipal level? Because what I'm getting at is there's, we're looking at maybe a 30% increase in the uh, not too distant future. So were we able to save any money, put it aside in anticipation of a, a greater caseload in the future? That's my question. Uh, through the chair, uh, the drop occurred largely um, in the 2021 um, budget year. Um, so there, you know, so any in-year savings that will be reflected going into the 2022 budget, I would suggest are not related to uh, the caseload reduction. Uh, as this committee is aware, all of the costs for the benefits are 100% funded by the province. Uh, so it would be the province that would realize those savings and then uh, our administrative our administrative budget uh, didn't change. This committee is also aware that um, our cost of administration with the province has been frozen since 2018. Um, and we don't really have the ability to, um, you know, to carry amounts forward provincially um, and typically not municipally um, for a rainy day as is being suggested. Uh, and the rainy day has already begun to occur. We are seeing an increase in new applications with the wind down of the, um, you know, the uh, pandemic benefits. Okay, um, not, not, not the answer I was hoping for, but the answer, so I uh, thank you. Councillor, thank you very much. Mayor, go ahead, please. Mayor Davis, that is. Yeah. <sighs> Thank you, Mr. Chair, and through you to staff. So this 30% drop, so you correspond and, and correlate that to the, the pandemic, what benefit called that CERB benefit, right? I, through the chair, to the extent that it, you can correlate caseload increases and decreases to uh, specific items, it's, a, it's often a little hard. Uh, we don't really have. Right. Uh, a good explanation for that. But that's I, what I can tell you is that um, M the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services is advancing that explanation. Right. And so how, but to qualify for the CERB, didn't you have to either be working or able to work or, I don't, I don't know, I didn't, I wasn't that familiar with, but my question to you is this, are, are, are any of those uh, recipients, previous recipients or other people that were on CERB, are they coming back? Are you seeing, I think you did mention in the report that you expected it. Is it happening now that the CERB benefit or the, whatever the successor was has been discontinued for the last two weeks? Through the chair, I'll invite our uh, manager, uh, one of our managers, Anthony Labatt, uh, who, who is in charge of our service support center intake function uh, to give you a little bit more detail on that. Good morning, members of committee. Um, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, thank you very much for the question, Mayor Davis. Um, <clears throat> so since September, we've seen about a 54% increase in applications. September, we had about 146 applications for social assistance locally. And in October, we've seen 218. Um, and if you look at October, 2020, the applications we received at that time was about 103. 
Um, so we anticipated seeing an increase in the number of applications for Ontario Works due to the ending of the federal benefits around the second or third week of October. But that actually began in the first week of October as, as individuals were anticipating the, the end of their federal benefits. So yes, we have seen a considerable increase already, a 54% increase between September and October. Uh, so one concern I hear from employers and businesses across the community and both in the city and the county is we just can't find enough people and we're having trouble staffing our operations and and many times it's uh, in unskilled staff and so I, I noticed that almost 60 percent of those on the caseload have at least a grade 12 education or higher but I think it's about 57 percent and then I noticed in the report that the barriers to employment are some is mental health and uh, but we've got caregiving responsibilities, 30%, uh, transportation, 16%, activity limitations, 14%. So that's about 60% of the reasons why those who are receiving social assistance um, are having difficulty uh, finding employment, which is probably the best way to secure their future of them and their families. So is there anything more? Can we do anything more targeted? I, I realize that you're trying to do that, but can we do like an extra special effort to help those who have those barriers like caregiver, transportation, activity limitations that we might be able to address, I guess, more effectively, more meaningfully so that they um, can take advantage of the many employment opportunities that are here in our communities. Yes, through the chair. Uh, so members of this committee will uh, know that this is a conversation we often have around this table, this disconnect between uh, what is now post uh, a little bit out, uh, post COVID a very robust labor market and yet uh, the persistently high social assistance caseload. So uh, one of the provincial changes of course is that uh, employment services uh, and connecting folks to employment is no longer a municipal responsibility. Um, however, we do have a role to play um, and part of that role is connecting people to our partners in Employment Ontario at the earliest opportunity, which we do. Uh, we're hopeful that some of these new entrants into the system may have, uh, as, as you suggested, Mr. Mayor, earlier, a bit more of a connection to the labour market prior to the pandemic. And so they may be more suitable to fill some of those employment opportunities. Um, however, because of the length of the pandemic, if they have been on CRB that entire time, they're already long-term unemployed and have that disconnection because they've not been working probably for the past 12 to 18 months. Um, but we are flowing um, people to Employment Ontario um, through the criteria that was established. And the other piece that our staff work very hard on is exactly as you suggest, putting together plans with individuals to um, you know, to resolve some of those barriers and challenges and move forward. Um, you know, one of the constraints to the work, which again is not news to this committee, um, is the um, service availability or lack thereof um, within, you know, some of the services that, that individuals require, um, particularly in the health sector. Uh, the health sector, of course, was heavily impacted by COVID. Uh, people do have difficulty uh, still connecting with primary care or getting the care that they need. Um, you know, procedures have been pushed back. Uh, in the report, you see some of the health challenges uh, that we have as a local community, and those are certainly reflected in our caseload. Um, so that lack of access to health and mental health care is probably one of the biggest challenges that our staff face in terms of trying to help people, um, you know, resolve the, the issues and, and actually move forward into employment. Are you well beyond your time? Let me ask if there are other speakers. Fine. Uh, I see no others. Mayor, did you wish to continue? Mayor Davis, that is. Mr. Chair. Uh, so Susan, what's your assessment of the, the work being done by Employment Ontario? Um, so through the chair, that's an excellent question that I cannot answer because we have not been provided with any information. We would be very interested to know how their um, placement rates for individuals on social assistance compare uh, to the results that we saw um, is we actually performed fairly, quite favorably compared to a lot of the other municipalities, uh, but we just simply have not been provided any information. 
Okay, well, Mr. Chair, I'm going to ask staff because there are some of us uh, on this committee who have, um, you know, contacts into the provincial government, and and if you get to the point where there's some really specific uh, recommendations or suggestions for employment on Ontario that you'd like those of us that um, have those connections to try and advance to the provincial government, please don't hesitate to use us. And I, and I realize to really be effective that way, though, it has to be very specific, right? Uh, suggesting concrete, specific changes to their program. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Mayor, thank you. I see no further speakers, so we'll go to the question on 6.1. A show of hands for those in favor, please. And that carries, thank you. Uh, let me just check my roadmap here. We don't have a resolution before us. We don't have a notice of motion and I'll remind the county folks that we no longer have a question period um, because of changes we've made to the city's procedural uh, rules. So we are adjourned folks. Uh, as quick as we can get back, we will get started with Brant and Brantford Local Housing Corporation Board of Directors. And uh, we'll just take uh, a very brief moment and then we'll forge ahead with that, okay. Okay, we have the roll call. Um, does anyone have a conflict of interest to declare? I see none. We have no delegations, we have no presentations. Could I get a mover and seconder for all the business before us? Moved by Councillor LaFerriere, seconded by Councillor Antosky. Uh, separations folks, Councillor Miller, go ahead, please. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I do have a question on the on the one report before us on uh, item three. On 4.1? <sighs> Decommissioning 4 of the heat system? Yeah, the heating system. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, We'll go ahead and call the vote then on the remainder of the business, that being the minutes, those in favor. And that carries, thank you guys. Uh, Councillor Miller, you have the floor to get started on 4.1. Go ahead, please. Okay, yeah, um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and I don't wanna be critical of anybody uh, for trying new things, especially when the, it's, they're trying to do a good thing and that was uh, save energy. And I, to be honest, I was quite, uh, Excited to see how much we're going to save on this. So it's 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 extremely, I think, disappointing to everybody around this table to see that uh, it is being decommissioned. Um, I'm not. Doesn't sound like the this company had the best uh, customer service going. Um, if they've only come out twice when there was clearly issues going on. So my question I, is, it's going to be a two part question. But the first question, Mr. Chair, is. Um, are we looking at, uh, is the province going to get any money refunded? Is there any warranty associated with this? What, what, how, did we, how did we protect ourselves from this? Or did we? That's my first question. Good morning, Deb Schlichter, Acting Director, Housing and Homelessness Services. And I... Um, through the chair. Um, this was a funding pot that the um, provincial government gave out. They've already allocated it out. Uh, we fully spent our allocation and we did purchase um, this system with some of that funding. So we did spend the money. The money was spent appropriately. Um, there is no requirement to return that money. Mr. Chair, if I could ask that question again, was there any warranty on it? Have you asked for any of the money back to return to the province? Sorry, the question is whether there was any warranty on the product. Yes, the, prod the product has a warranty on it. That the problem isn't that the product doesn't work. The product just doesn't work on this building. So the product could work perhaps on another building. And one of the ideas we have is perhaps um, we might be able to find a use for it somewhere else that is not a hydronic system. Uh, it doesn't seem to work well on that. It may work better on a different kind of a system. Okay, so just a question of clarification. So 
Through you, Mr. Chair. So you're saying it didn't work on the hydronic system, hydronic being a boiler. Um, and, and this company didn't know that ahead of time? This is what I'm, I'm having trouble understanding that. Because yes, I know. Uh, yeah. Yes, I, I understand. And we, we had the same level of frustration. I think uh, because it was fairly new um, system, it hadn't been fully tested on a wide variety of different types of buildings. And so it came out very quickly when this a program was available, people jumped on the, the bandwagon very quickly um, without a lot of history with the system. So we now see after the fact that it works better on certain kind of buildings than other buildings, but nobody knew that at that time. Including the company that sold it. Well, the company, uh, portrayed themselves as being able to work on anything and any, anywhere. Um, that's certainly how um, they would have sold their, their product, but um, it's in the actual use of the product that you find out whether it, it works across the board or just specifically with certain types of systems. Yeah. Last question. The, the second question, <laughs> um, that, that was the first one. Um, there's some decommissioning costs, I think $6,300, give or take. Have we asked, uh, given their rather poor customer service and the fact that they claim certain things that certainly didn't happen, have you asked for that money back? That was not part of the contract. The contract that we signed with them has been uh, fully paid. There is no money owing them or them owing us. This is our cost to decommission it. Um, yeah. So the answer is you didn't ask for it back. Mr. Chair, I would certainly make an amendment that we ask for that money back at the appropriate time, seeing if it works, <laughs> seeing if it flies, because I, I, I was quite upset when I read the whole report. Councilor Miller, go ahead and do that now. Um, I can't see anybody objecting. I, I move that uh, give, give, given the, um, the way things unfolded, the um, intent of or certain intended promises were made or things would work out a certain way and they did not, given the poor customer service and, and they, there was no, there, there, was, there wasn't a lot of follow up, only two. I would uh, move that uh, staff at least make an effort to recoup those uh, operational costs of decommissioning the system from the company involved. Councilor Miller, could I also ask you to include in your amendment a request to meet to City of Bradford legal staff to provide an in-camera report or meeting on this item to this committee at the next meeting? Yes, uh, yep, we can make that, yep. And Councilor Vanderstelt is the seconder. Um, any discussion on the amendment, folks? Councilor Vanderstelt. You sound surprised, Mr. Chair, thank you. <laughs> Uh, Councillor Miller is, is absolutely right. Yeah, it was a mismatched system uh, for a number of different reasons. It's really difficult to separate the zones in a service situation like this with multiple zones because uh, the, the user error uh, that they will refer to is the fact that the people who feel hot open their windows, the people who feel cold turn on a heater. Uh, and it's a, after that happens in the first uh, change of the weather, it's it's absolutely impossible for a system like this to catch up in any way, shape or form. So I, I agree with Councillor Miller. I, I think there was, uh, you know, uh, perhaps a little confusion about what product they were selling and how they sold it. Um, I don't see that it could have worked. The uh, number of calls and complaints that were generated from this, this, uh, this botched system uh, was, uh, was, was simply embarrassing. So I, I support this 100%. And uh, let's see we can, what we can get back out of them for uh, perhaps false advertising. I'm not sure exactly how far they went, but uh, I'd like to see something come from it. Thank you, uh, Councillor Miller. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, further discussion from committee members? Um, I'll, I'll ask a question of staff. Um, it was a non-competitive uh, process by which we procured this company. Uh, can, can staff indicate what other uh, providers were considered and how we came to uh, settle on these folks?
uh, through you. Um, my understanding is that the uh, sole sourcing option was because of the timing of the grant. The grant was uh, had a very tight time frame, and we got to the end of our spending of the shape dollars, and we had some money left over that we did not want to return to the province. So this was done under very tight timing. So that was the rationale behind the sole sourcing. Um, this particular product was being um, shopped around at that time and uh, a large number of housing providers had, had uh, already decided to put that into their system. So um, it seemed at that point a, a very good idea. It would help to reduce greenhouse gases and energy uh, costs. And so um, there didn't seem to be uh, any um, concerns at that time. Was anybody in the City of Brantford Facilities Department consulted with respect to the provider or the system? I believe uh, uh, there is somebody on the call today to uh, answer that from, uh, from Public Works Facilities. Um, is, is there somebody on the call right now? We've invited, um, I believe it's um, Brian, Donna, do you know who it is from facilities? Good morning through the chair. Rick Cox has been invited to attend this meeting. Thank you. But I don't think he's on the call, sorry. So do, 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 do housing staff not know whether or not um, our facilities department was consulted on this before awarding this uh, contract? We don't have the history, unfortunately, at this point. Um, we can dig that out to see. I, my understanding would be that the normal process would have taken place to consult um, within okay, our so own internal. Thank, thanks, Deb. So if you could provide that answer in an email later today to all the members of the committee, please. Um, do we know whether or not um, um, these folks were selling their products to other municipalities uh, in circumstances where they didn't work? Uh, through you, yes, we do know that um, this product has been used across uh, other service manager areas, in particular in Hamilton. And we do know that they have buildings where it works better than buildings um, similar to ours. So there is some uh, similar uh, experience happening um, across other areas. So, so the short answer to my question is yes, they've failed in other municipalities as well? Yes, for these kinds of buildings. Do they sell monorails as well? <laughs> Can't answer that one. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, further questions or discussion, guys? All right, seeing none, we'll go to the vote on this. Then those in favor, uh, please raise your hands. And that carries. Uh, we have dealt with the remainder of um, the items before us today, so uh, we are now adjourned. Thank you very much, folks, for being here today, and we'll see you again soon. Have a good day, everyone. Thanks, Paul. Hey. <clears throat>